The sexton task of piling earth above John Harmon all night long was not conducive to sound sleep, but Rokesmith had some broken morning rest, and rose strengthened in his purpose. It was all over now. No ghost should trouble Mr. and Mrs. Boffin's peace, invisible and voiceless. The ghost should look on for a little while longer at the state of existence out of which it had departed, and then should for ever cease to haunt the scenes in which it had no place. He went over it all again. He had lapsed into the condition in which he found himself, as many a man lapses into many a condition, without perceiving the accumulative power of its separate circumstances. When, in the distrust engendered by his wretched childhood, and the action for evil, never yet for good, within his knowledge then, of his father and his father's wealth, on all within their influence, he conceived the idea of his first deception. It was meant to be harmless. It was to last but a few hours or days. It was to involve in it only the girl so capriciously forced upon him, and upon whom he was so capriciously forced. And it was honestly meant well towards her. For if he had found her unhappy in the prospect of that marriage, through her heart inclining to another man, or for any other cause, he would seriously have said, This is another of the old perverted uses of the misery-making money. I will let it go to my and my sister's only protectors and friends. When the snare into which he fell so outstripped his first intention, as that he found himself placarded by the police authorities upon the London walls for dead, he confusedly accepted the aid that fell upon him, without considering how firmly it must seem to fix the boffins in their accession to the fortune. When he saw them, and knew them, and even from his vantage-ground of inspection could find no flaw in them, he asked himself, And shall I come to life to dispossess such people as these? There was no good to set against the putting of them to that hard proof. He had heard from Bella's own lips, when he stood tapping at the door on that night of his taking the lodgings, that the marriage would have been on her part thoroughly mercenary. He had since tried her, in his own unknown person and supposed station, and she not only rejected his advances, but resented them. Was it for him to have the shame of buying her, or the meanness of punishing her? Yet, by coming to life and accepting the condition of the inheritance, he must do the former, and by coming to life and rejecting it, he must do the latter. Another consequence that he had never foreshadowed was the implication of an innocent man in his supposed murder. He would obtain complete retraction from the accuser, and set the wrong right, but clearly the wrong could never have been done if he had never planned a deception. Then, whatever inconvenience or distress of mind the deception cost him, it was manful, repentantly, to accept as among its consequences, and make no complaint. Thus John Rokesmith in the morning, and it buried John Harmon still many fathoms deeper than he had been buried in the night. Going out earlier than he was accustomed to do, he encountered the cherub at the door. The cherub's way was for a certain space his way, and they walked together. It was impossible not to notice the change in the cherub's appearance. The cherub felt very conscious of it, and modestly remarked, "'A present from my daughter Bella, Mr. Rokesmith.' The words gave the secretary a stroke of pleasure, for he remembered the fifty pounds, and he still loved the girl. No doubt it was very weak, it always is very weak, some authorities hold, but he loved the girl. "'I don't know whether you happen to have read many books of African travel, Mr. Rokesmith?' said R. W. "'I have read several.' "'Well, you know, there's usually a King George, or a King Boy, or a King Sambo, or a King Bill, or Bull, or Rum, or Junk, or whatever name the sailors may have happened to give him.' "'Where?' asked Rokesmith. "'Anywhere. Anywhere in Africa, I mean. Pretty well everywhere, I may say, for black kings are cheap. And I think,' said R. W., with an apologetic air, "'nasty.' "'I am much of your opinion, Mr. Wilfer. You were going to say?' "'I was going to say the King is generally dressed in a London hat only, or a Manchester pair of braces, or one epaulette, or an uniform coat with his legs in the sleeves, or something of that kind.' "'Just so,' said the Secretary. "'In confidence, I assure you, Mr. Rokesmith, observed the cheerful cherub, that when more of my family were at home, and to be provided for, I used to remind myself immensely of that king. You have no idea, as a single man, of the difficulty I have had in wearing more than one good article at a time. I can easily believe it, Mr. Wilfer. I only mention it, said R. W., in the warmth of his heart, as a proof of the amiable, delicate, and considerate affection of my daughter Bella. 
if she had been a little spoilt, I couldn't have thought so very much of it, under the circumstances, but no, not a bit, and she is so very pretty. I hope you agree with me in finding her very pretty, Mr. Rokesmith. Certainly I do. Every one must. I hope so, said the cherub. Indeed, I have no doubt of it. This is a great advancement for her in life, Mr. Rokesmith, a great opening of her prospects. Miss Wilfer could have no better friends than Mr. and Mrs. Boffin. Impossible, said the gratified cherub. Really, I begin to think things are very well as they are. If Mr. John Harmon had lived— He is better dead, said the secretary. No, I won't go so far as to say that, urged the cherub, a little remonstrant against the very decisive and unpitying tone. But— he mightn't have suited Bella, or Bella mightn't have suited him, or fifty things, whereas now I hope she can choose for herself. Has she, as you place the confidence in me of speaking on the subject, you will excuse my asking, has she, perhaps, chosen? faltered the secretary. Oh, dear, no, returned R. W. Young ladies, sometimes, Rokesmith hinted, choose without mentioning their choice to their fathers. "'Not in this case, Mr. Rokesmith. Between my daughter Bella and me there is a regular league and covenant of confidence. It was ratified only the other day. The ratification dates from these,' said the cherub, giving a little pull at the lapels of his coat and the pockets of his trousers. "'Oh, no, she is not chosen. To be sure, young George Sampson, in the days when Mr. John Harmon, who I wish had never been born,' said the secretary, with a gloomy brow, R. W. looked at him with surprise, as thinking he had contracted an unaccountable spite against the poor deceased, and continued, "'In the days when Mr. John Harmon was being sought out, young George Sampson certainly was hovering about Bella, and Bella let him hover. But it never was seriously thought of, and it's still less than ever to be thought of now. For Bella is ambitious, Mr. Rokesmith, and I think I may predict will marry fortune.' This time, you see, she will have the person and the property before her together, and will be able to make her choice with her eyes open. This is my road. I am very sorry to part company so soon. Good morning, sir." The secretary pursued his way, not very much elevated in spirits by this conversation, and arriving at the Boffin mansion, found Betty Higden waiting for him. "'I should thank you kindly, sir,' said Betty. If I might make so bold as have a word or two with you." She should have as many words as she liked, he told her, and took her into his room, and made her sit down. "'Tis concerning Sloppy, sir,' said Betty, "'and that's how I come here by myself. Not wishing him to know what I'm a-going to say to you, I got the start of him early, and walked up." "'You have wonderful energy,' returned Rokesmith. "'You are as young as I am. Betty Higdon gravely shook her head. "'I am strong for my time of life, sir, but not young. Thank the Lord.' "'Are you thankful for not being young?' "'Yes, sir. If I was young, it would all have to be gone through again, and the end would be a weary way off, don't you see? But never mind me. Tis concerning Sloppy.' "'And what about him, Betty?' "'Tis just this, sir. It can't be reasoned out of his head by any powers of mine, but what that, he can do right by your kind lady and gentleman, and do his work for me both together. Now he can't. To give himself up to being put in the way of arning a good living and getting on, he must give me up. Well, he won't. I respect him for it, said Rokesmith. Do ye, sir? I don't know but what I do myself. Still, that don't make it right to let him have his way. So, as he won't give me up, I'm a-going to give him up. How, Betty? I'm a-going to run away from him. With an astonished look at the indomitable old face and the bright eyes, the secretary repeated, Run away from him? Yes, sir, said Betty, with one nod. And in the nod, and in the firm set of her mouth, there was a vigour of purpose not to be doubted. Come, come said the secretary. We must talk about this. Let us take our time over it, and try to get at the true sense of the case, and the true course, by degrees." "'Now, look here, my dear,' returned old Betty, "'asking your excuse for being so familiar, 
but being of a time of life almost to be your grandmother, twice over. Now, look here. Tis a poor living, and a hard, as is to be got out of this work that I'm a-doing now, and but for sloppy, I don't know as I should have held to it this long, but it did just keep us on the two together. Now that I'm alone, with even Johnny gone, I'd far sooner be upon my feet and tiring of myself out than a sitting folding and folding by the fire. And I'll tell you why. There's a deadness steals over me at times, that the kind of life favours and I don't like. Now I seem to have Johnny in my arms. Now his mother. Now his mother's mother. Now I, I seem to be a child myself, a lying once again in the arms of my own mother. Then I get numbed thought and sense, till I start out of my seat, a fear that I'm a-growing like the poor old people that they brick up in the unions, as you may sometimes see, when they let him out of the four walls to have a warm in the sun, crawling quite scared about the streets. I was a nimble girl, and have always been an active body, as I told your lady first time ever I see her good face. I can still walk twenty mile, if I'm put to it. I'd far better be a-walking than a-getting numbed and dreary. I'm a good fair knitter, and can make many little things to sell. The loan from your lady and gentleman of twenty shillings to fit out a basket with would be a fortune for me. Trudging round the country, and tiring of myself out, I shall keep the deadness off, and get my own bread by my own labour. And what more can I want? And this is your plan, said the secretary, for running away? Show me a better, my dearie, show me a better. "'Why, I know very well,' said old Betty Higdon, "'and you know very well that your lady and gentleman "'would set me up like the Queen for the rest of my life, "'if so be that we could make it right among us to have it so. "'But we can't make it right among us to have it so. "'I've never took charity yet, nor yet has any one belonging to me. "'And it would be forsaking of myself indeed, "'and forsaking of my children dead and gone, "'and forsaking of their children dead and gone, "'to set up a contradiction now at last.' "'It might come to be justifiable and unavoidable, at last,' the secretary gently hinted, with a slight stress on the word. "'I hope it never will. "'It ain't that I mean to give offence by being or anyways proud,' said the old creature simply, "'but that I want to be of a peace like, and helpful of myself, right through to me death.' "'And, to be sure,' added the secretary as a comfort for her, Sloppy will be eagerly looking forward to his opportunity of being to you what you have been to him. "'Trust him for that, sir,' said Betty, cheerfully, "'though he had need to be something quick about it, for I'm a-getting to be an old one. But I'm a strong one, too, and travel and weather never hurt me yet. Now, be so kind as to speak for me to your lady and gentleman, and tell him what I ask of their good friendliness to let me do, and why I ask it. The secretary felt that there was no gainsaying what was urged by this brave old heroine, and he presently repaired to Mrs. Boffin, and recommended her to let Betty Higdon have her way, at all events for the time. "'It would be far more satisfactory to your kind heart, I know,' he said, "'to provide for her. But it may be a duty to respect this independent spirit.' Mrs. Boffin was not proof against the consideration set before her. She and her husband had worked too and had brought their simple faith and honour clean out of dust-heaps. If they owed a duty to Betty Higdon, of a surety that duty must be done. "'But Betty,' said Mrs. Boffin, when she accompanied John Rokesmith back to his room, and shone upon her with the light of her radiant face, "'Granted all else, I think I wouldn't run away.' "'Twould come easier to sloppy,' said Mrs. Higdon, shaking her head. "'Twould come easier to me, too. But—' "'Tis as you please. "'When would you go?' "'Now,' was the bright and ready answer. "'Today, my dearie, to-morrow. "'Bless ye, I'm used to it. "'I know many parts of the country well. "'When nothing else was to be done, "'I have worked in many a market-garden afore now, "'and in many a hop-garden, too. "'If I give my consent to your going, Betty, "'which Mr. Rokesmith thinks I ought to do,' "'Betty thanked him with a grateful curtsy, "'We must not lose sight of you. "'We must not let you pass out of our knowledge. "'We must know all about you.' 
"'Yes, my dearie, but not through letter-writing, because letter-writing, indeed, writing of most sorts hadn't much come up for such as me when I was young. But I shall be to and fro, no fear of my missing a chance of giving myself a sight of your reviving face. Besides,' said Betty, with logical good faith, "'I shall have a debt to pay off by littles, and naturally that would bring me back, if nothing else would.' "'Must it be done?' asked Mrs. Boffin, still reluctant, of the secretary. "'I think it must.' After more discussion, it was agreed that it should be done, and Mrs. Boffin summoned Bella to note down the little purchases that were necessary to set Betty up in trade. "'Don't ye be timorous for me, my dear,' said the staunch old heart, observant of Bella's face. "'When I take my seat with my work, clean and busy and fresh, in a country market-place, I shall turn a sixpence, as sure as ever a farmer's wife there." The secretary took that opportunity of touching on the practical question of Mr. Sloppy's capabilities. "'He would have made a wonderful cabinet-maker,' said Mrs. Higdon, "'if there had been the money to, to put him to it.' She had seen him handle tools that he had borrowed to mend the mangle, or to knock a broken piece of furniture together in a surprising manner. As to constructing toys for the minders out of nothing, he had done that daily, and once as many as a dozen people had got together in the lane to see the neatness with which he fitted the broken pieces of a foreign monkey's musical instrument. "'That's well,' said the secretary. "'It will not be hard to find a trade for him.' John Harmon, being buried under mountains now, the secretary that very same day set himself to finish his affairs, and have done with him. He drew up an ample declaration, to be signed by Rogue Riderhood, knowing he could get his signature to it by making him another and much shorter evening call, and then considered to whom should be given the document. To Hexham's son or daughter? Resolved speedily to the daughter. But it would be safer to avoid seeing the daughter, because the son had seen Julius Hanford, and he could not be too careful. There might possibly be some comparison of notes between the son and daughter, which would awake slumbering suspicion, and lead to consequences. I might even, he reflected, be apprehended as having been concerned in my own murder. Therefore, best to send it to the daughter, under cover by the post. Pleasant Riderhood had undertaken to find out where she lived, and it was not necessary that it should be attended by a single word of explanation. So far, straight. But all that he knew of the daughter he derived from Mrs. Boffin's accounts of what she heard from Mr. Lightwood, who seemed to have a reputation for his manner of relating a story, and to have made this story quite his own. It interested him, and he would like to have the means of knowing more, as, for instance, that she received the exonerating paper, and that it satisfied her. By opening some channel altogether independent of Lightwood, who likewise had seen Julius Hanford, who had publicly advertised for Julius Hanford, and whom of all men he, the secretary, most avoided. But with whom the common course of things might bring me in a moment face to face any day, in the week, or any hour in the day. Now, to cast about for some likely means of opening such a channel, the boy Hexham was training for and with a schoolmaster. The secretary knew it, because his sister's share in that disposal of him seemed to be the best part of Lightwood's account of the family. This young fellow, Sloppy, stood in need of some instruction. If he, the secretary, engaged that schoolmaster to impart it to him, the channel might be opened. The next point was, did Mrs. Boffin know the schoolmaster's name? No, but she knew where the school was. Quite enough. Promptly the secretary wrote to the master of that school, and that very evening Bradley Headstone answered in person. The secretary stated to the schoolmaster how the object was to send to him, for certain occasional evening instruction, a youth whom Mr. and Mrs. Boffin wished to help to an industrious and useful place in life. The schoolmaster was willing to undertake the charge of such a pupil. The secretary inquired on what terms. The schoolmaster stated on what terms, agreed, and disposed of. "'May I ask, sir?' said Bradley Headstone, to whose good opinion I owe a recommendation to you. You should know that I am not the principal here. I am Mr. Boffin's secretary. Mr. Boffin is a gentleman who inherited a property, of which you may have heard some public mention, the Harmon property. Mr. Harmon, said Bradley, who would have been a great deal more at a loss than he was, if he had known to whom he spoke, was murdered and found in the river. Was murdered and found in the river. It was not. No interposed the secretary, smiling. "'It was not he who recommended you. Mr. Boffin heard of you through a certain Mr. Lightwood. I think you know Mr. Lightwood, or know of him.' 
"'I know as much of him as I wish to know, sir. I have no acquaintance with Mr. Lightwood, and I desire none. I have no objection to Mr. Lightwood, but I have a particular objection to some of Mr. Lightwood's friends, in short, to one of Mr. Lightwood's friends, his great friend.' He could hardly get the words out even then and there, so fierce did he grow, though keeping himself down with an infinite pains of repression, when the careless and contemptuous bearing of Eugene Rayburn rose before his mind. The secretary saw there was a strong feeling here on some sore point, and he would have made a diversion from it, but for Bradley's holding to it in his cumbersome way. "'I have no objection to mention the friend by name,' he said doggedly. "'The person I object to is Mr. Eugene Rayburn.' The secretary remembered him. In his disturbed recollection of that night, when he was striving against the drugged drink, there was but a dim image of Eugene's person. But he remembered his name, and his manner of speaking, and how he had gone with them to view the body, and where he had stood, and what he had said. "'Pray, Mr. Headstone, what is the name?' he asked again, trying to make a diversion, of uh, young Hexham's sister. "'Her name is Lizzie,' said the schoolmaster with a strong contraction of his whole face. "'She is a young woman of a remarkable character, is she not?' "'She is sufficiently remarkable to be very superior to Mr. Eugene Rayburn, though an ordinary person might be that,' said the schoolmaster. "'And I hope he will not think it impertinent in me, sir, to ask why you put the two names together.' "'By mere accident,' returned the secretary. Observing that Mr. Rayburn was a disagreeable subject with you, I tried to get away from it, though not very successfully, it would appear. Do you know Mr. Rayburn, sir? No. Then perhaps the names cannot be put together on the authority of any representation of his. Certainly not. I took the liberty to ask, said Bradley, after casting his eyes on the ground, because he is capable of making any representation in the swaggering levity of his insolence. I, I hope you'll not misunderstand me, sir. I, I am much interested in this brother and sister, and the subject awakens very strong feelings within me. Very, very strong feelings. With a shaking hand, Bradley took out his handkerchief and wiped his brow. The secretary thought, as he glanced at the schoolmaster's face, that he had opened a channel here indeed, and that it was an unexpectedly dark and deep and stormy one, and difficult to sound. All at once, in the midst of his turbulent emotions, Bradley stopped, and seemed to challenge his look, much as though he suddenly asked him, "'What do you see in me?' "'The brother, young Hexham, was your real recommendation here,' said the secretary, quietly going back to the point. "'Mr. and Mrs. Boffin, happening to know, through Mr. Lightwood, that he was your pupil, anything that I ask respecting the brother and sister, or either of them, I ask for myself, out of my own interest in the subject, and not in my official character, or on Mr. Boffin's behalf.' How I come to be interested, I need not explain. You know the father's connection with the discovery of Mr. Harmon's body. Sir, replied Bradley, very restlessly indeed, I know all the circumstances of that case. Pray tell me, Mr. Headstone, said the secretary, does the sister suffer under any stigma because of the impossible accusation? Groundless would be a better word that was made against the father and substantially withdrawn. No, sir, returned Bradley with a kind of anger. I am very glad to hear it. The sister, said Bradley, separating his words over carefully, and speaking as if he were repeating them from a book, suffers under no reproach that repels a man of unimpeachable character who had made for himself every step of his way in life from placing her in his own station. I will not say raising her to his own station, I say placing her in it. A sister labours under no reproach unless she should unfortunately make it for herself. When such a man is not deterred from regarding her as his equal, and when he has convinced himself that there is no blemish on her, I think the fact must be taken to be pretty expressive. And there is such a man, said the secretary. Bradley Headstone knotted his brows, and squared his large lower jaw, and fixed his eyes on the ground with an air of determination that seemed unnecessary to the occasion, as he replied, "'And there is such a man.' The secretary had no reason or excuse for prolonging the conversation, and it ended here. Within three hours the oakum-headed apparition once more dived into the leaving shop, and that night Rogue Riderhood's recantation lay in the post-office, addressed under cover to Lizzie Hexham at her right address. All these proceedings occupied John Rokesmith so much, that it was not until the following day that he saw Bella again. It seemed then to be tacitly understood between them, that they were to be as distantly easy as they could, 
without attracting the attention of Mr. and Mrs. Boffin to any marked change in their manner. The fitting out of old Betty Higden was favourable to this, as keeping Bella engaged and interested, and as occupying the general attention. "'I think,' said Rokesmith, when they all stood about her, while she packed her tidy basket, except Bella, who was busily helping, on her knees, at the chair on which it stood. "'That, at least, you might keep a letter in your pocket, Mrs. Higden, which I would write for you, and date from here, merely stating, in the names of Mr. and Mrs. Boffin, that they are your friends. I won't say patrons, because they wouldn't like it.' "'No, no, no,' said Mr. Boffin. "'No patronising. Let's keep out of that, whatever we come to.' "'There's more than enough of that about without us, ain't there, Noddy?' said Mrs. Boffin. "'I believe you, old lady,' returned the Golden Dustman. "'Over much, indeed.' "'But people sometimes like to be patronised, don't they, sir?' asked Bella, looking up. "'I don't. And if they do, my dear, they ought to learn better,' said Mr. Boffin. "'Patrons and patronesses, and vice-patrons, and vice-patronesses, and deceased patrons, and deceased patronesses, and ex-vice-patrons, and ex-vice-patronesses. What does it all mean, in the books of the charities that come pouring in on Rokesmith, as he sits among them pretty well up to his neck? If Mr. Tom Noakes gives his five shillings, ain't he a patron?' And if Mrs. Jack Stiles gives her five shillings, ain't she a patroness? What the deuce is it all about? If it ain't stark staring impudence, what do you call it? Don't be warm, Noddy, Mrs. Boffin urged. Warm? cried Mr. Boffin. It's enough to make a man smoky not. I can't go anywhere without being patronised. I don't want to be patronised. If I buy a ticket for a flower show, or a music show, or any sort of show, and pay pretty heavy for it, why am I to be patroned and patronessed, as if the patrons and patronesses treated me? If there's a good thing to be done, can't it be done in its own merits? If there's a bad thing to be done, can it ever be patroned and patronessed right? Yet, when a new institution's going to be built, it seems to me that the bricks and mortar ain't made of half so much consequence as the patrons and patronesses. No, nor yet the objects. I wish somebody would tell me whether other countries get patronised to anything like the extent of this one. And as to the patrons and patronesses themselves, I wonder they're not ashamed of themselves. They ain't pills, or hair washes, or invigorating nervous essences to be puffed in that way." Having delivered himself of these remarks, Mr. Boffin took a trot, according to his usual custom, and trotted back to the spot from which he had started. "'As to the letter, Rokesmith,' said Mr. Boffin, "'you're as right as a trivet. Give her the letter, make her take the letter, put it in her pocket by violence. She might fall sick. You know you might fall sick,' said Boffin. "'Don't deny it, Mrs. Higdon. In your obstinacy, you know you might.' Old Betty laughed and said that she would take the letter, and be thankful. "'That's right,' said Mr. Boffin. "'Come, that's sensible. And don't be thankful to us, for we never thought of it, but to Mr. Rokesmith.' The letter was written, and read to her, and given to her. "'Now, how do you feel?' said Mr. Boffin. "'Do you like it?' "'The letter, sir,' said Betty. "'Ay, oh, it's a beautiful letter.' "'No, no, no, not a letter,' said Mr. Boffin. "'The idea. Are you sure you're strong enough to carry out the idea?' "'I shall be stronger, and keep the deadness off better this way, than any way left open to me, sir.' "'Don't say, than any way left open, you know,' urged Mr. Boffin, "'because there are ways without end. A housekeeper would be acceptable over yonder at the bower, for instance. Wouldn't you like to see the bower, and know a retired literary man, of the name of Wegg, that lives there, with a wooden leg?' Old Betty was proof even against this temptation, and fell to adjusting her black bonnet and shawl. "'I wouldn't let you go, now it comes to this after all,' said Mr. Boffin, "'if I didn't hope that it may make a man and a workman of sloppy, in a shorter time as ever a man and workman was made yet. Why, what have you got there, Betty? Not a doll?' It was the man in the guards who had been on duty over Johnny's bed. The solitary old woman showed what it was, and put it up quietly in her dress. Then she gratefully took leave of Mrs. Boffin, and of Mr. Boffin, and of Rokesmith and then put her old withered arms round Bella's young and blooming neck, and said, repeating Johnny's words, "'A kiss for the boofer lady.' The secretary looked on from a doorway at the boofer lady thus encircled, and still looked on at the boofer lady standing alone there, when the determined old figure, with its steady bright eyes, was trudging through the streets, away from paralysis and pauperism. End of Book Two, Chapter Fourteen our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens Book Two, Birds of a Feather Chapter Fifteen, The Whole Case So Far Bradley Headstone held fast by that other interview he was to have with Lizzie Hexham. In stipulating for it, 
he had been impelled by a feeling little short of desperation, and the feeling abided by him. It was very soon after his interview with the secretary, that he and Charlie Hexam set out one leaden evening, not unnoticed by Miss Peacher, to have this desperate interview accomplished. "'That doll's dressmaker,' said Bradley, "'is favourable neither to me nor to you, Hexam. "'A pert, crooked little chit, Mr. Headstone. "'I knew she put herself in the way if she could, "'and would be sure to strike him with something impertinent. "'It was on that account that I proposed our going to the city to-night "'and meeting my sister.' "'So I supposed,' said Bradley, "'getting his gloves on his nervous hands as he walked. "'So I supposed.' "'Nobody but my sister.' pursued Charlie, would have found out such an extraordinary companion. She's done it in ridiculous fancy of giving herself up to another. She told me so that night when we went there. Why should she give herself up to the dressmaker? asked Bradley. Oh, said the boy, colouring, one of her romantic ideas. I tried to convince her so, but I didn't succeed. However, what we have got to do is to succeed to-night, Mr. Headstone, and then all the rest follows. You are still sanguine, Hexham. "'Certainly I am, sir. Why, we have everything on our side.' "'Except your sister, perhaps,' thought Bradley, but he only gloomily thought it, and said nothing. "'Everything on our side,' repeated the boy, with boyish confidence. "'Respectability, an excellent connection for me, common sense, everything.' "'To be sure, your sister has always shown herself a devoted sister,' said Bradley, willing to sustain himself on even that low ground of hope. "'Naturally, Mr. Headstone.' I have a good deal of influence with her. And now that you have honoured me with your confidence, and spoken to me first, I say again, we have everything on our side. And Bradley thought again, except your sister, perhaps. A grey, dusty, withered evening in London City has not a hopeful aspect. The closed warehouses and offices have an air of death about them, and the national dread of colour has an air of mourning. The towers and steeples of the many house-encompassed churches, dark and dingy as the sky that seems descending on them, are no relief to the general gloom. A sundial on a church wall has the look, in its useless black shade, of having failed in its business enterprise, and stopped payment for ever. Melancholy waifs and strays of housekeepers and porters sweep melancholy waifs and strays of papers and pins into the kennels, and other more melancholy waifs and strays explore them, searching and stooping and poking for anything to sell. The set of humanity outward from the city is as a set of prisoners departing from jail, and dismal Newgate seems quite as fit a stronghold for the mighty Lord Mayor as his own state dwelling. On such an evening, when the city grit gets into the hair and eyes and skin, and when the fallen leaves of the few unhappy city trees grind down in corners under wheels of wind, the schoolmaster and the pupil emerged upon the Leadenhall Street region, spying eastward for Lizzie. Being something too soon in their arrival, they lurked at a corner, waiting for her to appear. The best-looking amongst us will not look very well, lurking at a corner, and Bradley came out of that disadvantage very poorly indeed. "'Here she comes, Mr. Headstone. Let us go forward and meet her.' As they advanced, she saw them coming, and seemed rather troubled, but she greeted her brother with the usual warmth, and touched the extended hand of Bradley. "'Why, where are you going, Charlie, dear?' she asked him then. "'Nowhere. We came on purpose to meet you.' "'To meet me, Charlie?' "'Yes. We're going to walk with you. But don't let us take the great leading streets, where everyone walks, and we can't hear ourselves speak. Let us go by the quiet back ways. Here's a large paved court by this church, and quiet, too. Let us go up here. But it's not in the way, Charlie. Yes, it is, said the boy petulantly. It's in my way, and my way is yours. She had not released his hand, and, still holding it, looked at him with a kind of appeal. He avoided her eyes, under pretence of saying— "'Come along, Mr. Headstone.' Bradley walked at his side, not at hers, and the brother and sister walked hand in hand. The court brought them to a churchyard, a paved square court, with a raised bank of earth about breast-high, in the middle, enclosed by iron rails. Here, conveniently and healthfully, elevated above the level of the living, were the dead, and the tombstones, some of the latter droopingly inclined from the perpendicular, as if they were ashamed of the lies they told. They paced the whole of this place once, in a constrained and uncomfortable manner, when the boy stopped, and said, "'Lizzie, Mr. Edstone has something to say to you. I don't wish to be an interruption either to him or to you, and so I'll go and take a little stroll and come back. I know in a general way what Mr. Edstone intends to say, and I very highly approve of it, as I hope, 
and indeed I do not doubt you will. I needn't tell you, Lizzie, that I am under great obligations to Mr. Headstone, and that I am very anxious for Mr. Headstone to succeed in all he undertakes, as I hope, and as indeed I don't doubt, you must be. Charlie, returned his sister, detaining his hand as he withdrew it, I think you had better stay. I think Mr. Headstone had better not say what he thinks of saying. Why, how do you know what it is? returned the boy. Perhaps I don't. But perhaps you don't. No, Liz, I should think not. If you knew what it was, you would give me a very different answer. There, let go, be sensible. I wonder you don't remember that Mr. Headstone is looking on. She allowed him to separate himself from her, and he, after saying, Now, Liz, be a rational girl and a good sister, walked away. She remained standing alone with Bradley Headstone, and it was not until she raised her eyes that he spoke. "'I said,' he began, "'when I saw you last, that there was something unexplained which might perhaps influence you. I have come this evening to explain it. I hope you will not judge of me by my hesitating manner when I speak to you. You see me at my greatest disadvantage. It is most unfortunate for me that I wish you to see me at my best, and that I know you see me at my worst.' She moved slowly on when he paused, and he moved slowly on beside her. "'It seems egotistical to begin by saying so much about myself,' he resumed. "'But whatever I say to you seems, even in my own ears, below what I want to say, and different from what I want to say. I can't help it. So it is. You are the ruin of me.' She started at the passionate sound of the last words and at the passionate action of his hands with which they were accompanied. "'Yes, you are the ruin, the ruin, the ruin of me. I have no resources in myself. I have no confidence in myself. I have no government of myself when you are near me, or, or in my thoughts. And you are always in my thoughts now. I have never been quit of you since I first saw you. Oh, that was a wretched day for me. That was a wretched, miserable day.' A touch of pity for him mingled with her dislike of him, and she said, "'Mr. Headstone, I am grieved that I have done you any harm, but I have never meant it.' "'There!' he cried despairingly. "'Now I seem to have reproached you, instead of revealing to you the state of my own mind. Bear with me. I am always wrong when you are in question. It is my doom.' Struggling with himself, and by times looking up at the deserted windows of the houses, as if there could be anything written in their grimy panes that would help him, he paced the whole pavement at her side, before he spoke again. "'I must try to give expression to what is in my mind. It shall, and must be spoken. Though you see me so confounded, though you strike me so helpless, I ask you to believe that there are many people who think well of me, that there are some people who highly esteem me, that I have, in my way, won a station which is considered worth winning. Surely, Mr. Headstone, I do believe it. Surely I have always known it from Charlie. I ask you to believe that if I were to offer my home such as it is, my station such as it is, my affections such as they are, to any one of the best considered and best qualified and most distinguished among the young women engaged in my calling, they would probably be accepted, even readily accepted. I do not doubt it, said Lizzie, with her eyes upon the ground. I have sometimes had it in my thought to make that offer, and to settle down, as many men of my class do. I, on the one side of a school, my wife on the other, both of us interested in the same work. "'Why have you not done so?' asked Lizzie Hexham. "'Why do you not do so?' "'Far better that I never did. The only one grain of comfort I have had these many weeks,' he said, always speaking passionately and when most emphatic, repeating that former action of his hands, which was like flinging his heart's blood down before her in drops upon the pavement stones. The only one grain of comfort I have had these many weeks is that I never did. For if I had, and if the same spell had come upon me for my ruin, I know I should have broken that tie asunder, as if it had been a thread. She glanced at him with a glance of fear, and a shrinking gesture. He answered as if she had spoken. No! It would not have been voluntary on my part, any more than it is voluntary in me to be here now. You draw me to you. If I were shut up in a strong prison, you would draw me out. 
I should break through the wall to come to you. If I were lying on a sick bed, you would draw me up to stagger to your feet and fall there. The wild energy of the man, now quite let loose, was absolutely terrible. He stopped and laid his hand upon a piece of the coping of the burial ground enclosure, as if he would have dislodged the stone. No man knows, till the time comes, what depths are within him. To some men it never comes. Let them rest and be thankful. To me you brought it. On me you forced it. And the bottom of this raging sea, striking himself upon the breast, has been heaved up ever since. Mr. Headstone, I have heard enough. Let me stop you here. It will be better for you, and better for me. Let us find my brother. Not yet. It shall, and must be spoken. I have been in torments ever since I stopped short of it before. You are alarmed. It is another of my miseries that I cannot speak to you or speak of you without stumbling at every syllable, and that I let the check go altogether and run mad. Here is a man lighting the lamps. You will be gone directly. I entreat of you, let us walk round this place again. You have no reason to look alarmed. I can restrain myself, and I will. She yielded to the entreaty. How could she do otherwise? And they paced the stones in silence. One by one the lights leaped up, making the cold grey church tower more remote, and they were alone again. He said no more until they had regained the spot where he had broken off. There he again stood still, and again grasped the stone. In saying what he said then, he never looked at her, but looked at it, and wrenched at it. You know what I am going to say. I love you. What other men may mean when they use that expression, I cannot tell. What I mean is that I am under the influence of some tremendous attraction, which I have resisted in vain, and which overmasters me. You could draw me to fire. You could draw me to water. You could draw me to the gallows. You could draw me to any death. You could draw me to anything I have most avoided. You could draw me to any exposure and disgrace. This and the confusion of my thoughts, so that I am fit for nothing, is what I mean by your being the ruin of me. But— if you would return a favourable answer to my offer of myself in marriage, you could draw me to any good, every good, with equal force. My circumstances are quite easy, and you would want for nothing. My reputation stands quite high, and would be a shield for yours. If you saw me at my work, able to do it well and respected in it, you might even come to take a sort of pride in me. I would try hard that you should, whatever considerations I may have thought of against this offer. I have conquered and I make it with all my heart. Your brother favours me to the utmost, and it is likely that we might live and work together. Anyhow, it is certain that he would have my best influence and support. I don't know what I could say more if I tried. I might only weaken what is ill enough said as it is. I only add that, if it is any claim on you to be in earnest, I am in thorough earnest, dreadful earnest. The powdered mortar from under the stone at which he wrenched rattled on the pavement to confirm his words. "'Mr. Headstone—' "'Stop. I implore you, before you answer me, to walk round this place once more. It will give you a minute's time to think, and me a minute's time to get some fortitude together.' Again she yielded to the entreaty, and again they came back to the same place, and again he worked at the stone. "'Is it—' he said, with his attention apparently engrossed by it. Yes, or no. Mr. Headstone, I thank you sincerely, I thank you gratefully, and hope you may find a worthy wife before long, and be very happy. But it is no. Is no short time necessary for reflection? No weeks or days? he asked, in the same half-suffocated way. None whatever. Are you quite decided? "'And is there no chance of any change in my favour? "'I am quite decided, Mr. Headstone, "'and I am bound to answer. "'I am certain there is none.' "'Then,' said he, suddenly changing his tone and turning to her, "'and bringing his clenched hand down upon the stone "'with a force that laid the knuckles raw and bleeding, "'then I hope that I may never kill him.' "'The dark look of hatred and revenge, "'with which the words broke from his livid lips, and with which he stood holding out his smeared hand as if it held some weapon, and had just struck a mortal blow, made her so afraid of him that she turned to run away. But he caught her by the arm. "'Mr. Headstone, let me go! Mr. Headstone, I must call for help!' 
"'It is I who should call for help,' he said. "'You don't know yet how much I need it.' The working of his face, as she shrank from it, glancing round for her brother and uncertain what to do, might have extorted a cry from her in another instant. But all at once he sternly stopped it and fixed it, as if death itself had done so. "'There. You see, I have recovered myself. Hear me out.' With much of the dignity of courage, as she recalled her self-reliant life and her right to be free from accountability to this man, she released her arm from his grasp, and stood looking full at him. She had never been so handsome in his eyes. A shade came over them, while he looked back at her, as if she drew the very light out of them to herself. "'This time, at least, I will leave nothing unsaid.' He went on, folding his hands before him, clearly to prevent his being betrayed into any impetuous gesture. "'This last time, at least, I will not be tortured with afterthoughts of a lost opportunity. Mr. Eugene Rayburn.' "'Was it of him you spoke, in your ungovernable rage and violence?' Lizzie Hexton demanded with spirit. He bit his lip and looked at her, and said never a word. "'Was it Mr. Rayburn that you threatened?' He bit his lip again, and looked at her, and said never a word. "'You asked me to hear you out, and you will not speak. Let me find my brother.' "'Stay. I threatened no one.' Her look dropped for an instant to his bleeding hand. He lifted it to his mouth, wiped it on his sleeve, and again folded it over the other. "'Mr. Eugene Rayburn,' he repeated. "'Why do you mention that name again and again, Mr. Headstone?' "'Because... It is the text of the little I have left to say. Observe. There are no threats in it. If I utter a threat, stop me, and fasten it upon me. Mr. Eugene Rayburn. A worse threat than was conveyed in his manner of uttering the name could hardly have escaped him. He haunts you. You accept favours from him. You are willing enough to listen to him. I know it as well as he does. Mr. Rayburn has been considerate and good to me, sir," said Lizzie proudly, in connection with the death and with the memory of my poor father. No doubt. He is, of course, a very considerate and a very good man, Mr. Eugene Rayburn. He is nothing to you, I think," said Lizzie, with an indignation she could not repress. Oh, yes, he is. There you mistake. He is much to me. What can he be to you? "'He can be a rival to me, among other things,' said Bradley. "'Mr. Headstone,' returned Lizzie, with a burning face, "'it is cowardly in you to speak to me in this way, "'but it makes me able to tell you that I do not like you, "'and that I have never liked you from the first, "'and that no other living creature has anything to do "'with the effect you have produced upon me for yourself.' His head bent for a moment, as if under a weight, and he then looked up again, moistening his lips. I was going on with the little I had left to say. I knew all this about Mr. Eugene Rayburn, all the while you were drawing me to you. I strove against the knowledge, but quite in vain. It made no difference in me. With Mr. Eugene Rayburn in my mind I went on. With Mr. Eugene Rayburn in my mind I spoke to you just now. With Mr. Eugene Rayburn in my mind I had been set aside, and I had been cast out. "'If you give those names to my thanking you for your proposal and declining it, "'is it my fault, Mr. Headstone?' said Lizzie, "'compassionating the bitter struggle he could not conceal, "'almost as much as she was repelled and alarmed by it. "'I am not complaining,' he returned. "'I am only stating the case. "'I had to wrestle with my self-respect "'when I submitted to be drawn to you in spite of Mr. Rayburn. "'You may imagine how low my self-respect lies now.' "'She was hurt and angry.' but repressed herself in consideration of his suffering, and of his being her brother's friend. "'And it lies under his feet,' said Bradley, unfolding his hands in spite of himself, and fiercely motioning with them both towards the stones of the pavement. "'Remember that. It lies under that fellow's feet, and he treads upon it and exults above it.' "'He does not,' said Lizzie. "'He does,' said Bradley. "'I have stood before him face to face.' and he crushed me down in the dirt of his contempt, and walked over me. Why? Because he knew with triumph what was in store for me to-night. "'Oh, Miss Redstone, you talk quite wildly.' "'Quite collectedly. I know what I say too well. Now I have said all. 
I have used no threat, remember. I have done no more than show you how the case stands. How the case stands, so far. At this moment her brother sauntered into view close by. She darted to him, and caught him by the hand. Bradley followed, and laid his heavy hand on the boy's opposite shoulder. "'Charlie Hexham, I am going home. I must walk home by myself to-night, and get shut up in my room without being spoken to. Give me half an hour's start, and let me be, till you find me at my work in the morning. I shall be at my work in the morning. That's as usual.' Clasping his hands, he uttered a short, unearthly, broken cry, and went his way. The brother and sister were left looking at one another, near a lamp in the solitary churchyard, and the boy's face clouded and darkened, as he said in a rough tone, "'What is the meaning of this? What have you done to my best friend? Out with the truth!' "'Charlie,' said his sister, "'speak a little more considerately.' "'I am not in a humour for consideration, or for nonsense of any sort,' replied the boy. "'What have you been doing? Why has Mr. Headstone gone from us in that way?' "'He asked me, you know he asked me, to be his wife, Charlie.' "'Well,' said the boy impatiently, "'and I was obliged to tell him that I could not be his wife.' "'You were obliged to tell him?' repeated the boy angrily, between his teeth, and rudely pushing her away. "'You were obliged to tell him. Do you know that he's worth fifty of you?' "'It may easily be so, Charlie, but I cannot marry him.' "'You mean that you are conscious that you can't appreciate him, and don't deserve him, I suppose?' "'I mean that I do not like him, Charlie, and that I will never marry him.' "'Upon my soul! exclaimed the boy. "'You're a nice picture of a sister. Upon my soul, you're a pretty piece of disinterestedness. And so all my endeavours to cancel the past, and erase myself on the world, and erase you with me, are beaten down by your low whims, are they?' "'I will not reproach you, Charlie.' "'Yeah!' exclaimed the boy, looking round at the darkness. "'She won't reproach me.' She does her best to destroy my fortunes in her own, and she won't reproach me. Why, you'll tell me next that you won't reproach Mr. Headstone for coming out of the sphere to which he is and an ornament, and putting himself at your feet to be rejected by you. No, Charlie, I will only tell you, as I told him myself, that I thank him for doing so, and I am sorry he did so, and that I hope he will do much better and be happy. Some touch of compunction smote the boy's hardening heart as he looked upon her. His patient little nurse in infancy, his patient friend, adviser, and reclaimer in boyhood, the self-forgetting sister who had done everything for him, his tone relented, and he drew her arm through his. "'Now, come, Liz, don't let us quarrel. Let us be reasonable and talk this over like brother and sister. Will you listen to me?' "'Oh, Charlie,' she replied through her starting tears. Do I not listen to you, and hear many hard things? Then I am sorry. There, Liz, I am unfeignedly sorry. Only you do put me out so. Now see, Mr. Edstown is perfectly devoted to you. He has told me in the strongest manner that he has never been his old self for one single minute since I first brought him to see you. Miss Peacher, our schoolmistress, pretty and young and all that, is known to be very much attached to him, and he won't so much as look at her, or hear of her. Now, his devotion to you must be a disinterested one, mustn't it? If he married Miss Peacher, he would be a great deal better off in all worldly respects than in marrying you. Well, then, he has nothing to get by it, has he? Nothing, heaven knows. Very well, then, said the boy. That's something in his favour, and a great thing. "'Then I come in. Mr. Edstone has always got me on, and he has a good deal in his power, and, of course, if he was my brother-in-law, he wouldn't get me on less, but would get me on more. Mr. Edstone comes and confides in me, in a very delicate way, and says, "'I hope my marrying your sister would be agreeable to you, Exham, and useful to you. I say, there's nothing in the world, Mr. Edstone, that I could be better pleased with.' Mr. Headstone says, then I may rely upon your intimate knowledge of me for your good word with your sister, Exham. And I say, certainly, Mr. Headstone, and naturally I have a good deal of influence with her. So I have, haven't I, Liz? Yes, Charlie. Well said. Now, you see, we begin to get on. The moment we begin to be really talking it over like brother and sister. Very well. Then you come in. 
as Mr. Headstone's wife, you would be occupying a most respectable station, and you would be holding a far better place in society than you hold now, and you would at length get quit of the riverside and the old disagreeables belonging to it, and you would be rid for good of dolls' dressmakers and their drunken fathers and the like of that. Not that I want to disparage Miss Jenny Wren. I dare say she's all very well in her way, but her way is not your way, as Miss Headstone's wife. Now, you see, Liz, on all three accounts, on Miss Headstone's, on mine, on yours, nothing could be better or more desirable. They were walking slowly as the boy spoke, and here he stood still to see what effect he had made. His sister's eyes were fixed upon him, but as they showed no yielding, and as she remained silent, he walked her on again. There was some discomfiture in his tone as he resumed, though he tried to conceal it. "'Having so much influence with you, Liz, as I have, perhaps I should have done better to have had a little chat with you in the first instance, before Mr. Headstone spoke for himself. But really, all this in his favour seems so plain and undeniable. I knew you to have always been so reasonable and sensible, that I didn't consider it worth while. Very likely that was a mistake of mine. However, it soon set right. All that need be done to set it right is for you to tell me at once— that I may go home and tell Mr. Edstone that what has taken place is not final, and it will all come round by and by. He stopped again. The pale face looked anxiously and lovingly at him, but she shook her head. "'Can't you speak?' said the boy sharply. "'I am very unwilling to speak, Charlie. If I must, I must. I cannot authorise you to say any such thing to Mr. Headstone. I cannot allow you to say any such thing to Mr. Headstone. Nothing remains to be said to him from me, after what I have said for good and all to-night. "'And this girl,' cried the boy, contemptuously throwing her off again, "'calls herself a sister.' "'Charlie, dear, that is the second time that you've almost struck me. Don't be hurt by my words. I don't mean, heaven forbid, that you intended it, but you hardly know with what a sudden swing you removed yourself from me.' However said the boy, taking no heed of the remonstrance, and pursuing his own mortified disappointment. "'I know what this means, and you shall not disgrace me.' "'It means what I've told you, Charlie, and nothing more.' "'That's not true,' said the boy in a violent tone, "'and you know it's not. It means your precious Mr. Rayburn. That's what it means. "'Charlie, if you remember any old days of ours together, forbear. But you shall not disgrace me.' doggedly pursued the boy. I am determined that after I have climbed up out of the mire, you shall not pull me down. You can't disgrace me if I have nothing to do with you, and I will have nothing to do with you for the future. Charlie, on many a night like this, and many a worse night, I have sat on the stones of the street, hushing you in my arms, and say those words without even saying you are sorry for them, and my arms are open to you still, and so is my heart. I'll not unsay them. I'll say them again. You are an inveterately bad girl, and a false sister, and I have done with you, for ever I have done with you." He threw up his ungrateful and ungracious hand, as if it set up a barrier between them, and flung himself upon his heel, and left her. She remained impassive on the same spot, silent and motionless, until the striking of the church clock roused her, and she turned away. But then, with the breaking up of her immobility, came the breaking up of the waters that the cold heart of the selfish boy had frozen, and, "'Oh, that I were lying here with the dead!' and, "'Oh, Charlie, Charlie, that this should be the end of our pictures in the fire!' were all the words she said, as she laid her face in her hands on the stone coping. A figure passed by, and passed on, but stopped and looked round at her. It was the figure of an old man with a bowed head, wearing a large-brimmed, low-crowned hat and a long-skirted coat. After hesitating a little, the figure turned back, and, advancing with an air of gentleness and compassion, said, "'Pardon me, young woman, for speaking to you, but you are under some distress of mind. I cannot pass upon my way and leave you weeping here alone, as if there was nothing in the place. Can I help you? Can I do anything to give you comfort?' She raised her head at the sound of these kind words, and answered gladly, "'Oh, Mr. Fryer, is it you?' "'My daughter,' said the old man, "'I stand amazed. I spoke as to a stranger. Take my arm, take my arm. What grieves you? Who has done this? Poor 
girl, poor girl. My brother has quarrelled with me, sobbed Lizzie, and renounced me. He is a thankless dog, said the Jew angrily. Let him go. Shake the dust on thy feet and let him go. Come, daughter, come home with me. It is but across the road, and take a little time to recover your peace and to make your eyes seemly, and then I will bear you company through the streets, for it is past your usual time and will soon be late, and the way is long, and there is much company out of doors to-night. She accepted the support he offered her, and they slowly passed out of the churchyard. They were in the act of emerging into the main thoroughfare, when another figure, loitering discontentedly by, and looking up the street and down it, and all about, started and exclaimed, "'Lizzie! Why, where have you been? Why, what's the matter?' As Eugene Rayburn thus addressed her, she drew closer to the Jew, and bent her head. The Jew, having taken in the whole of Eugene at one sharp glance, cast his eyes upon the ground, and stood mute. "'Lizzie, what is the matter?' "'Mr. Rayburn, I cannot tell you now. I cannot tell you to-night, if I ever can tell you. Pray, leave me.' "'But, Lizzie, I came expressly to join you. I came to walk home with you, having dined at a coffee-house in this neighbourhood, and knowing your hour. And I have been lingering about,' added Eugene, like a bailiff, or, with a look at Ryer, an old uh, clothesman. The Jew lifted up his eyes, and took in Eugene once more, at another glance. "'Mr. Rayburn, pray, pray, leave me with this protector, uh, and one thing more.' Pray, pray be careful of yourself. Mysteries of Udolpho, said Eugene, with a look of wonder, may I be excused for asking, in the elderly gentleman's presence, who is this kind protector? A trustworthy friend, said Lizzie. I will relieve him of his trust, returned Eugene. But you must tell me, Lizzie, what is the matter? Her brother is the matter, said the old man, lifting up his eyes again. "'Our brother the matter?' returned Eugene, with airy contempt. "'Our brother is not worth a thought, far less a tear. What has our brother done?' The old man lifted up his eyes again, with one grave look at Rayburn, and one grave glance at Lizzie, as she stood looking down. Both were so full of meaning, that even Eugene was checked in his light career, and subsided into a thoughtful, "'Hm!' With an air of perfect patience, the old man, remaining mute, and keeping his eyes cast down, stood retaining Lizzie's arm, as though in his habit of passive endurance it would be all one to him if he had stood there motionless all night. "'If Mr. Aaron,' said Eugene, who soon found this fatiguing, "'will be good enough to relinquish his charge to me, he will be quite free for any engagement he may have at the synagogue. Mr. Aaron, will you have the kindness?' But the old man stood stock still. "'Good evening, Mr. Aaron,' said Eugene politely. "'We need not detain you.' Then turning to Lizzie, "'Is our friend Mr. Aaron a little deaf?' "'My hearing is very good, Christian gentleman,' replied the old man calmly. "'But I will hear only one voice to-night, desiring me to leave this damsel before I have conveyed her to her home. If she requests it, I will do it. I will do it for no one else.' "'May I ask why so, Mr. Aaron?' said Eugene, quite undisturbed in his ease. "'Excuse me. If she asks me, I will tell her,' replied the old man. "'I will tell no one else.' "'I do not ask you,' said Lizzie, "'and I beg you to take me home. Mr. Rayburn, I have had a bitter trial to-night, and I hope you'll not think me ungrateful, or mysterious, or changeable. I am neither. I am wretched.' "'Pray remember what I said to you. Pray, pray, take care.' "'My dear Lizzie,' he returned in a low voice, bending over her on the other side, "'of what? Of whom?' "'Of any one you have lately seen and made angry.' He snapped his fingers and laughed. "'Come,' said he, "'since no better may be, Mr. Aaron and I will divide this trust, and see you home together.' Mr. Aaron on that side, I on this. If perfectly agreeable to Mr. Aaron, the escort will now proceed. He knew his power over her. He knew that she would not insist upon his leaving her. He knew that, her fears for him being aroused, she would be uneasy if he were out of her sight. 
for all his seeming levity and carelessness, he knew whatever he chose to know of the thoughts of her heart. And going on at her side, so gaily, regardless of all that had been urged against him, so superior in his sallies and self-possession to the gloomy constraint of her suitor and the selfish petulance of her brother, so faithful to her, as it seemed, when her own stock was faithless, what an immense advantage, what an overpowering influence, were his that night! Add to the rest, poor girl, that she had heard him vilified for her sake, and that she had suffered for his, and where the wonder that his occasional tones of serious interest, setting off his carelessness, as if it were assumed to calm her, that his lightest touch, his lightest look, his very presence beside her in the dark common street, were like glimpses of an enchanted world, which it was natural for jealousy and malice and all meanness to be unable to bear the brightness of, and to gird at as bad spirits might. Nothing more being said of repairing to Ryers, they went direct to Lizzie's lodging. A little short of the house-door, she parted from them, and went in alone. "'Mr. Aaron,' said Eugene, when they were left together in the street, "'with many thanks for your company. It remains for me unwillingly to say farewell.' "'Sir,' returned the other, "'I give you good-night, and I wish that you were not so thoughtless.' "'Mr. Aaron,' returned Eugene, "'I give you good-night, and I wish—' for you are a little dull, that you are not so thoughtful. But now that his part was played out for the evening, and when in turning his back upon the Jew he came off the stage, he was thoughtful himself. "'How did uh, Lightwood's catechism run?' he murmured, as he stopped to light his cigar. "'What is to come of it? What are you doing? Where are you going? We shall soon know now. Ah!' with a heavy sigh. The heavy sigh was repeated as if by an echo an hour afterwards, when Riah, who had been sitting on some dark steps in a corner over against the house, arose and went his patient way, stealing through the streets in his ancient dress, like the ghost of a departed time. End of Book Two, Chapter Fifteen Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens Book Two, Birds of a Feather Chapter Sixteen, An Anniversary Occasion the estimable Twemlow, dressing himself in his lodgings over the stable-yard in Duke Street, St. James's, and hearing the horses at their toilet below, finds himself on the whole in a disadvantageous position, as compared with the noble animals at livery. For whereas, on the one hand, he has no attendant to slap him soundingly, and require him in gruff accents to come up and come over, still, on the other hand, he has no attendant at all, and the mild gentleman's finger-joints and other joints, working rustily in the morning, he could deem it agreeable even to be tied up by the countenance at his chamber door, so he were there skilfully rubbed down and slushed and sluiced and polished and clothed, while himself taking merely a passive part in these trying transactions. How the fascinating Tippins gets on, when arraying herself for the bewilderment of the senses of men, is known only to the graces and her maid. But perhaps even that engaging creature, though not reduced to the self-dependence of Twemlow, could dispense with a good deal of the trouble attendant on the daily restoration of her charms, seeing that as to her face and neck this adorable divinity is, as it were, a diurnal species of lobster, throwing off a shell every forenoon, and needing to keep in a retired spot until the new crust hardens. Howbeit Twemlow doth at length invest himself with collar and cravat, and wristbands to his knuckles, and goeth forth to breakfast and to breakfast with whom but his near neighbours the lammels of sackville street who have imparted to him that he will meet his distant kinsman mr fledgeby the awful snigsworth might taboo and prohibit fledgeby but the peaceable twemlow reasons if he is my kinsman i didn't make him so and to meet a man is not to know him it is the first anniversary of the happy marriage of mr and mrs lammel and the celebration is a breakfast, because a dinner, on the desired scale of sumptuosity, cannot be achieved within less limits than those of the non-existent palatial residents, of which so many people are madly envious. So Twemlow trips, with not a little stiffness, across Piccadilly, sensible of having once been more upright in figure, and less in danger of being knocked down by swift vehicles. To be sure, that was in the days when he hoped for leave, from the dread Snigsworth, to do something, or be something, in life and before that magnificent Tartar issued the UK's, as he will never distinguish himself, he must be a poor gentleman pensioner of mine, and let him hereby consider himself pensioned. Ah, my Twemlow! Say, little feeble grey personage, what thoughts are in thy breast to-day, of the fancy, so still to call her, who bruised thy heart when it was green, and thy head brown, 
and whether it be better or worse, more painful or less, to believe in the fancy to this hour, than to know her for a greedy, armour-plated crocodile, with no more capacity of imagining the delicate and sensitive and tender spot behind thy waistcoat, than of going straight at it with a knitting-needle. Say, likewise, my Twemlow, whether it be the happier lot, to be a poor relation of the great, or to stand in the wintry slush, giving thee hack-horses to drink out of the shallow tub at the coach-stand, into which thou hast so nearly set thy uncertain foot. Twemlow says nothing, and goes on. As he approaches the Lammel's door, drives up a little one-horse carriage, containing Tippins the Divine. Tippins, letting down the window, playfully extols the vigilance of her cavalier in being in waiting there to hand her out. Twemlow hands her out with as much polite gravity as if she were anything real, and they proceed upstairs. Tippins all abroad about the legs, and seeking to express that those unsteady articles are only skipping in their native buoyancy. "'And dear Mrs. Lammel, and dear Mr. Lammel, how do you do? And when are you going down to what's-its-name place? Guy, Earl of Warwick, you know. What is it, uh, Dun Cow, to claim the flitch of bacon? And Mortimer, whose name is for ever blotted out from my list of lovers, by reason first of fickleness, and then of base desertion, how do you do, wretch?' "'And Mr. Rayburn, you here, what can you come for, because we're all very sure beforehand that you're not going to talk? And veneering M.P., how are things going on down at the house, and when will you turn out those terrible people for us? And Mrs. Veneering, my dear, can it positively be true that you go down to that stifling place night after night to hear those men prose? Talking of which, veneering, why don't you prose?' for you haven't opened your lips there yet, and we're dying to hear what you have got to say to us. Miss Podsnap, charmed to see you. Pa here? No. Ma neither? No. Oh. Mr. Boots, delighted. Mr. Brewer, this is a gathering of the clans. Thus Tippins, and surveys Fledgeby and outsiders through golden glass, murmuring as she turns about and about, in her innocent giddy way, Anybody else I know. "'No, I think not. Nobody there, nobody there, nobody anywhere.' Mr. Lammel, all a-glitter, produces his friend Fledgeby, as dying for the honour of presentation to Lady Tippins. Fledgeby presented, has the air of going to say something, has the air of going to say nothing, has an air successively of meditation, of resignation, and of desolation, backs on Brewer, makes the tour of boots, and fades into the extreme background, feeling for his whisker as it might have turned up since he was there five minutes ago. But Lammel has him out again, before he has so much as completely ascertained the bareness of the land. He would seem to be in a bad way, Fledgeby, for Lammel represents him as dying again. He is dying now, of want of presentation to Twemlow. Twemlow offers his hand, glad to see him. "'Your mother, sir, was a connection of mine.' "'I believe so,' says Fledgeby. "'But my mother and her family were, too.' "'Are you staying in town?' asked Twemlow. "'I always am,' says Fledgeby. "'You like town,' says Twemlow, but is felled flat by Fledgeby's taking it quite ill, and replying, "'No, he don't like town.' Lammel tries to break the force of the fall, by remarking that some people do not like town, Fledgeby retorting that he never heard of any such case but his own. Twemlow goes down again, heavily. "'There is nothing uh, new this morning, I suppose?' says Twemlow, returning to the mark with great spirit. Fledgeby has not heard of anything. "'No, there's not a word of news,' says Lemmel. "'Not a particle,' adds Boot. "'Not an atom,' chimes in Brewer. Somehow the execution of this little concerted piece appears to raise the general spirits, as with the sense of duty done, and sets the company a-going. Everybody seems more equal than before to the calamity of being in the society of everybody else. Even Eugene, standing in a window, moodily swinging the tassel of a blind, gives it a smarter jerk now, as if he found himself in better case. Breakfast announced, everything on table showy and gaudy, but with a self-assertingly temporary and nomadic air on the decorations, as boasting that they will be much more showy and gaudy in the palatial residence. Mr. Lammel's own particular servant behind his chair, the analytical behind Veneering's chair, instances in point that such servants fall into two classes, one mistrusting the master's acquaintances, and the other mistrusting the master, Mr. Lammel's servant of the second class. Appearing to be lost in wonder and low spirits, because the police are so long in coming to take his master up on some charge of the first magnitude. Veneering M.P. on the right of Mrs. Lammel, Twemlow on her left, Mrs. Veneering, W.M.P., 
wife of Member of Parliament, and Lady Tippins on Mr. Lammle's right and left. But be sure that well within the fascination of Mr. Lammle's eye and smile sits little Georgiana, and be sure that close to little Georgiana, also under inspection by the same gingerous gentleman, sits Fledgeby. Often than twice or thrice while breakfast is in progress, Mr. Twemlow gives a little sudden turn towards Mrs. Lammle, and then says to her, "'I beg your pardon.' This not being Twemlow's usual way, why is it his way to-day? Why, the truth is, Twemlow repeatedly labours under the impression that Mrs. Lammle is going to speak to him, and turning finds that it is not so, and mostly that she has her eyes upon veneering. Strange that this impression so abides by Twemlow, after being corrected, yet so it is. Lady Tippins, partaking plentifully of the fruits of the earth, including grape-juice in the category, becomes livelier, and applies herself to illicit sparks from Mortimer Lightwood. It is always understood among the initiated that that faithless lover must be planted at table opposite to Lady Tippins, who will then strike conversational fire out of him. In a pause of mastication and deglutiation, Lady Tippins, contemplating Mortimer, recalls that it was at our dear veneerings, and in the presence of a party who are surely all here, that he told them his story of the man from somewhere, which afterwards became so horribly interesting and vulgarly popular. "'Yes, Lady Tippins,' assents Mortimer, "'as they say on the stage, even so. "'Then we expect you,' retorts the charmer, "'to sustain your reputation and tell us something else.' "'Lady Tippins, I exhausted myself for life that day, and there is nothing more to be got out of me.' Mortimer parries thus, with a sense upon him that elsewhere it is Eugene, and not he, who is the jester, and that in these circles where Eugene persists in being speechless, he, Mortimer, is but the double of the friend on whom he has founded himself. "'But,' quoth the fascinating Tippins, "'I am resolved on getting something more out of you. Traitor! What is this I hear about another disappearance?' "'As it is you who have heard it,' returns Lightwood, "'perhaps you'll tell us.' "'Monster! Away!' retorts Lady Tippins. "'Your own golden dustman referred me to you.' Mr. Lammle, striking in here, proclaims aloud that there is a sequel to the story of the man from somewhere. Silence ensues upon the proclamation. "'I assure you,' says Lightwood, glancing round the table, "'I have nothing to tell.' But Eugene, adding in a low voice, "'There, tell it, tell it!' He corrects himself with the addition, "'Nothing worth mentioning.' Boots and Brewer immediately perceive that it is immensely worth mentioning, and become politely clamorous. Veneering is also visited by a perception to the same effect. But it is understood that his attention is now rather used up, and difficult to hold, that being the tone of the House of Commons. "'Pray, don't be at the trouble of composing yourselves to listen.' says Mortimer Lightwood, because I shall have finished long before you have fallen into comfortable attitudes. It's like—it's like, impatiently interrupts Eugene, the children's narrative. I'll tell you a story of Jack and Minori, and now my story's begun. I'll tell you another of Jack and his brother, and now my story is done. Get on and get it over. Eugene says this with a sound of vexation in his voice, leaning back in his chair, and looking balefully at Lady Tippins, who nods to him as her dear bear and playfully insinuates that she, a self-evident proposition, is beauty, and he, beast. "'The reference,' proceeds Mortimer, "'which I suppose to be made by my honourable and fair enslaver opposite, is to the following circumstance. Very lately the young woman, Lizzie Hexham, daughter of the late Jessie Hexham, otherwise Gaffer, who will be remembered to have found the body of the man from somewhere, mysteriously received, she knew not from whom, an explicit retraction of the charges made against her father by another waterside character of the name of Riderhood.' Nobody believed them, because little rogue Riderhood, I am tempted into the paraphrase by remembering the charming wolf, who would have rendered society a great service if he had devoured Mr. Riderhood's father and mother in their infancy, had previously played fast and loose with the said charges, and, in fact, abandoned them. However, the retraction I have mentioned found its way into Lizzie Hexham's hands, with a general flavour on it of having been favoured by some anonymous messenger in a dark cloak and slouched hat, and was by her forwarded in her father's vindication to Mr. Boffin, my client." You will excuse the phraseology of the shop, but as I never had another client, and in all likelihood never shall have, I am rather proud of him, as a natural curiosity, probably unique. Although as easy as usual on the surface, Lightwood is not quite as easy as usual below it. With an air of not minding Eugene at all, he feels that the subject is not altogether a safe one in that connection. The natural curiosity which forms the sole ornament of my professional museum, he resumes, Hereupon desires his secretary, an individual of the hermit crab or oyster species, and whose name, I think, is Chokesmith. But it doesn't in the least matter. 
say, Artichoke, to put himself in communication with Lizzie Hexham. Artichoke professes his readiness so to do, endeavours to do so, but fails. "'Why fails?' asks Boots. "'How fails?' asks Brewer. Uh, "'Pardon me,' returns Lightwood. "'I must postpone the reply for one moment, or we shall have an anticlimax. Artichoke failing signally, my client refers the task to me, his purpose being to advance the interests of the object of his search. I proceed to put myself in communication with her, I even happen to possess some special means, with a glance at Eugene, of putting myself in communication with her. But I fail too, because she has vanished. Vanished, is the general echo. Disappeared, says Mortimer. Nobody knows how, nobody knows when, nobody knows where, and so ends the story to which my honourable and fair enslaver opposite referred. Tippins, with a bewitching little scream, opines that we shall every one of us be murdered in our beds. Eugene eyes her as if some of us would be enough for him. Mrs. Veneering, W.M.P., remarks that these social mysteries make one afraid of leaving baby. Veneering, M.P., wishes to be informed, with something of a second-hand air of seeing the right honourable gentleman at the head of the home department in his place, whether it is intended to be conveyed that the vanished person has been spirited away, or otherwise harmed. Instead of Lightwood's answering, Eugene answers, and answers hastily and vexedly. No, 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 he doesn't mean that. He means voluntarily vanished, but utterly, completely. However, the great subject of the happiness of Mr. and Mrs. Lammle must not be allowed to vanish with the other vanishments with the vanishing of the murderer, the vanishing of Julius Hanford, the vanishing of Lizzie Hexham, and therefore veneering must recall the present sheep to the pen from which they have strayed. Who is so fit to discourse of the happiness of Mr. and Mrs. Lammle, they being the dearest and oldest friends he has in the world, or what audience so fit for him to take into his confidence as that audience, a noun of multitude or signifying many, who are all the oldest and dearest friends he has in the world? So veneering, without the formality of rising, launches into a familiar oration, gradually toning into the parliamentary sing-song, in which he sees at that board his dear friend Twemlow, who on that day twelve-month bestowed on his dear friend Lammle the fair hand of his dear friend Sophronia, and in which he also sees at that board his dear friend's boots and brewer, who's rallying round him at a period when his dear friend Lady Tippins likewise rallied round him, ay, and in the foremost rank he can never forget while memory holds her seat. But he is free to confess that he misses from that board his dear old friend Potsnap, though he is well represented by his dear young friend Georgiana, and he further sees at that board, this he announces with pomp, as if exulting in the powers of an extraordinary telescope, his friend Mr. Fledgeby, if he will permit him to call him so. For all of these reasons, and many more which he right well knows will have occurred to persons of your exceptional acuteness, he is here to submit to you that the time has arrived when, with our hearts in our glasses, with tears in our eyes, with blessings on our lips, and in a general way with the profusion of gammon and spinach in our emotional larders, we should one and all drink to our dear friends the Lammles, wishing them many years as happy as the last, and many, many friends as congenially united as themselves. And this he will add that Anastasia Veneering, who is instantly heard to weep, is formed on the same model as her old and chosen friend Sophronia Lammle, in respect that she is devoted to the man who wooed and won her, and nobly discharges the duties of a wife. Seeing no better way out of it, Veneering here pulls up his oratorical pegasus, extremely short, and plumps down clean over his head with, Lammle, God bless you. Then Lammle, too much of him every way, pervadingly too much nose of a coarse wrong shape, and his nose and his mind and his manners, too much smile to be real, too much frown to be false, too many large teeth to be visible at once, without suggesting a bite. He thanks you, dear friends, for your kindly greeting, and hopes to receive you, it may be on the next of these delightful occasions, in a residence better suited to your claims on the rights of hospitality. He will never forget that at Veneering's he first saw Sophronia. Sophronia will never forget that at Veneering's she first saw him. They spoke of it soon after they were married, and agreed that they would never forget it. In fact, to Veneering they owe their union. They hope to show their sense of this some day. No, no, from Veneering, oh, yes, yes, and let him rely upon it. They will, if they can. His marriage with Sophronia was not a marriage of interest on either side. She had her little fortune, he had his little fortune. They joined their little fortunes. It was a marriage of pure inclination and suitability. Thank you. Sophronia and he are fond of the society of young people, but he is not sure that their house would be a good house for young people proposing to remain single, since the contemplation of its domestic bliss might induce them to change their minds. He will not apply this to any one present, certainly not to their darling little Georgiana. Again, thank you. Neither, by the by, will he apply it to his friend Fledgeby. He thanks Veneering for the feeling manner in which he referred to their common friend Fledgeby, for he holds that gentleman in the highest estimation. Thank you. In fact, returning unexpectedly to Fledgeby, the better you know him, the more you find in him that you desire to know. 
Again, thank you. In his dear Sophronia's name, and in his own, thank you. Mrs. Lammle has sat quite still, with her eyes cast down upon the tablecloth. As Mr. Lammle's address ends, Twemlow once more turns to her involuntarily, not cured yet of that often recurring impression that she is going to speak to him. This time she really is going to speak to him. Veneering is talking with his other next neighbour, and she speaks in a low voice. Mr. Twemlow. He answers, I beg your pardon, no, uh, yes? Still a little doubtful, because of her not looking at him. "'You have the soul of a gentleman, and I know I may trust you. "'Will you give me the opportunity of saying a few words to you when you come upstairs?' "'Assuredly, I, I shall be honoured. "'Don't seem to do so, if you please, "'and don't think it inconsistent if my manner should be more careless than my words. "'I may be watched.' "'Intensely astonished, Tremlow puts his hand to his forehead "'and sinks back in his chair, meditating. "'Mrs. Lammle rises. All rise. The ladies go upstairs.' The gentlemen soon saunter after them. Fledgeby has devoted the interval to taking observation of Boots' whiskers, Brewer's whiskers, and Lammle's whiskers, and considering which pattern of whisker he would prefer to produce out of himself by friction, if the genie of the cheek would only answer to his rubbing. In the drawing-room, groups form as usual. Lightwood, Boots, and Brewer flutter like moths around that yellow wax candle, guttering down, and with some hint of a winding sheet in it, Lady Tippins. Outsiders cultivate Veneering M.P. and Mrs. Veneering W.M.P. Lammle stands with folded arms, Mephistophelean in a corner, with Georgiana and Fledgeby. Mrs. Lammle, on a sofa by a table, invites Mr. Twemlow's attention to a book of portraits in her hand. Mr. Twemlow takes his station on a settee before her, and Mrs. Lammle shows him a portrait. "'You have reason to be surprised,' she says softly, "'but I wish you wouldn't look so.' Disturbed Twemlow, making an effort not to look so, looks much more so. "'I think, Mr. Twemlow, you never saw that distant connection of yours before to-day?' "'No, never. Now that you do see him, you see what he is. You are not proud of him?' "'To say the truth, Mrs. Lammle, no. If you knew more of him, you would be less inclined to acknowledge him. Here is another portrait. What do you think of it?' Twemlow has just presence of mind enough to say aloud, "'Very like, uh, uncommonly like.' "'You have noticed, perhaps, whom he favours with his attention. "'You notice where he is now, and how engaged?' "'Yes, but Mr. Lamble—' "'She darts a look at him, which she cannot comprehend, "'and shows him another portrait. "'Very good, is it not?' Uh, "'Charming,' uh, says Twemlow. "'So like, as to be almost a caricature. "'Mr. Twemlow, it is impossible to tell you "'what the struggle in my mind has been, "'before I could bring myself to speak to you as I do now.' It is only in the conviction that I may trust you never to betray me, that I can proceed. Sincerely promise me that you never will betray my confidence, that you will respect it even though you may no longer respect me, and I shall be as satisfied as if you had sworn it. Madam, on the honour of a poor gentleman, thank you. I can desire no more. Mr. Twemlow, I implore you to save that child. That child? Georgiana. She will be sacrificed. She will be inveigled and married to that connection of yours. It is a partnership affair, a money speculation. She has no strength of will or character to help herself, and she is on the brink of being sold into wretchedness for life. Amazing! But, oh, what can I do to prevent it? demands Twemlow, shocked and bewildered to the last degree. Here is another portrait, and not good, is it? Aghast at the light manner of her throwing her head back to look at it critically, Twemlow still dimly perceives the expediency of throwing his own head back and does so, though he no more sees the portrait than if it were in China. "'Decidedly not good,' says Mrs. Lemmel, stiff and exaggerated. And uh, ex Twemlow, in his demolished state, cannot command the word and trails off into uh, exactly so. "'Mr. Twemlow?' Your word will have weight with her pompous, self-blinded father. You know how much he makes of your family. Lose no time. Warn him. But warn him against whom? Against me. By great good fortune, Tramlow received a stimulant at this critical instant. The stimulant is Lamel's voice. Sophronia, my dear, what portraits are you showing Twemlow? Public characters, Alfred. Show him the last of me. Yes, Alfred. She puts the book down takes another book up, turns the leaves, and presents the portrait to Twemlow. "'That is the last of Mr. Lammle. Do you think it good? Warn her father against me. I deserve it, for I have been in the scheme from the first. It is my husband's scheme, your connections, and mine. 
I tell you this only to show you the necessity of the poor little foolish affectionate creature's being befriended and rescued. You will not repeat this to her father. You will spare me so far, and spare my husband, for, though this celebration of to-day is all a mockery, he is my husband, and we must live. Do you think it like? Tremlow, in a stunned condition, feigns to compare the portrait in his hand with the original looking towards him from his Mephistophelian corner. Very well, indeed, are at length the words which Tremlow, with great difficulty, extracts from himself. I am glad you think so. On the whole, I myself consider it the best. The others are so dark. Now here, for instance, is another of Mr. Lammle. But I don't understand. I don't see my way. Tremlow stammers, as he falters over the book with his glass at his eye. How warn her father? Not tell him. Tell him how much. Tell him how little. I, I, I am getting lost. Tell him I am a matchmaker. Tell him I am an artful and designing woman. Tell him you are sure his daughter is best out of my house and my company. Tell him any such things of me. They will all be true. You know what a puffed-up man he is, and how easily you can cause his vanity to take the alarm. Tell him as much as will give him the alarm, and make him careful of her, and spare me the rest. Mr. Twemlow, I feel my sudden degradation in your eyes. Familiar as I am with my degradation in my own eyes, I keenly feel the change that must have come upon me in yours, in these last few moments. But I trust to your good faith with me as implicitly as when I began. If you knew how often I have tried to speak to you to-day, you would almost pity me. I want no new promise from you, on my own account, for I am satisfied, and I always shall be satisfied with the promise you have given me. I can venture to say no more, for I see that I am watched. If you would set my mind at rest with the assurance that you will interpose with the father and save this harmless girl, close that book, before you return it to me, and I shall know what you mean, and deeply thank you in my heart. Alfred, Mr. Twemlow thinks the last one the best, and quite agrees with you and me. Alfred advances, the groups break up, Lady Tippins rises to go, and Mrs. Veneering follows her leader. For the moment Mrs. Lammle does not turn to them, but remains looking at Twemlow, looking at Alfred's portrait through his eyeglass. The moment passed, Twemlow drops his eyeglass at its ribbon's length, rises and closes the book with an emphasis which makes the fragile nursling of the fairies, Tippins, start. Then good-bye and good-bye, and charming occasion worthy of the golden age, and more about the flitch of bacon and the like of that and Tremlow goes staggering across Piccadilly, with his hand to his forehead, and is nearly run down by a flushed letter-cart, and at last drops safe in his easy chair, innocent good gentleman, with his hand to his forehead still, and his head in a whirl. End of Book Two Chapter Sixteen